go ahead and get started with our panel. This is the uh, Disruptors panel. My name is Karen Finney, and I actually host a show uh, called Disrupt. So I'm thrilled to be up here with uh, some disruptors. I'm going to introduce our panel, and we're going to kind of get right to it, and then we'll take questions uh, towards the end. Uh, Joe Sorrell is the director of Europe and Middle East at the B Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation. <laughs> We've known each other since for a long time, so I apologize. Probably have to, I'm going to try to be serious, I promise. Very serious. Okay. Uh, Jeff McGrath, Managing Director, McLaren Applied Technologies, to my far right. To my left, Saad Mosini, Chairman and CEO of Mo Moby Group. Uh, to uh, his left, Nancy Liu, CEO of Nplug Incorporated and founder of Nanoly Bioscience. And on the far left, Ryan Kavanaugh, founder and CEO of Relativity Media. So I'm gonna st I want to start by sort of posing a question uh, for each of you uh, to respond to, and that is, I mean, you are all people who, in your relative fields, and maybe you can speak a little bit about this in answering the question, saw and see opportunity where others saw roadblocks, saw challenges that could not be overcome. And each of you developed new ways of doing things, new, whether it's you know, Ryan, new business models, new ways of thinking about how to do finance film and finance the projects that you work on, um, to Joe, some of the things that you do at the uh, Gates Foundation in terms of how to deliver um, you know, medicines to but then also how to make that sort of do good and do well and kind of sort of change the branding almost a little bit of it. So, uh, and I'm actually going to start with Jeff because it's one of the most interesting, I think, uh, in that it's the application of sort of the Formula One uh, idea uh, to uh, applied to totally not having to do with uh, racing cars, but having to do with uh, data and health and a whole host of other things. Sure. I mean, most people know McLaren for Formula One racing. Um, I set head up the technology group, which is applying both the technology and the mindset of a team of people who are driven to win, and they actually have to innovate just to survive. So for me, I think when you're trying to be successful taking a business orthogonal to what most people know you for, it's not enough to just have a technology. You need to actually have the design skills and the passion and the mindset to make sure that people adopt that technology in order to be successful. And we've found that we can do that by partnering with people who share our ambition to win, which in commercial terms tends to be people who want to be the best at what they do, the first to do something, or raise the bar on what was considered the limit of performance up to date. So we tend to seek out pioneers and visionaries, partner with them, co-create with them, and then through them, get global reach from a base originally just here in the UK, but soon, um, to build on our Asian presence and out into America, East and West Coast. And how do you, uh, throughout your organization, ensure that that sort of visionary spirit, that winning spirit, is you know sort of from top to bottom is embodied in the work that you're doing? It happens on many levels. Actually, not least the environment in which we work actually screams perfection. We work at McLaren Technology Center here in Woking. Um, the first impression when you walk in is like, a surgical theater, the floor is bright white, such that imperfection would shout. Um, but this is also a place where we assemble cars, where we build racing cars. There's no radio blurring in the background. There's no chaos. There's no noise, actually. There's, it's calm because people are working under quite extreme pressure to innovate and reproduce a prototype that will be tested very publicly against an audience over a year of 600 million people. That's a sport with the highest viewership in the world. So there's nowhere to hide if your performance isn't good. So the environment is the first place. The work ethic, um, everybody's driven to be excellent. So obviously you start by hiring the best resources you can get. But then the peer pressure is such that there's nowhere to hide if you're actually not performing. It's a very narrow church. But um, in the racing world, that's just what you want, to be driven for results. In the business world, we try and marry that technical perfection with creative skill. So it's a, it's a marriage of actually people like I see on the panel here from <laughs> creative world, from the media world, from the games world. We've consciously brought them in to work with those engineers who are like an inch wide and a mile deep. They can solve any problem once it's defined. But the act of creative genius is to define the problem in the first place, or in commercial terms, to define what people would value. I mean, innovation isn't about creating ideas. It's about creating value. 
that would be adopted. And for that, we tend to lean a lot on creatives and then follow through with real muscle on the technical excellence. So, Ryan, I'm going to go to you next to kind of play off of that idea about, because um, traditionally I think we've thought of filmmaking as, you know, art and gut, and you have brought a whole new approach to it in terms of math and science and uh, a rigor that I think is a very different mindset than how things have been done traditionally. Talk a little bit about that. Sure. Well, I think I probably had the easiest job of anybody in this panel because I look at what every person has done. There's some stroke of genius behind it. And mine was just looking at an industry that was 100 years old and still ran exactly the same it did when they were created in 1916. And, you know, a, a, a major roadblock that the studios had put up so nobody else could change it. And applying general business principles that any person who had business common sense could actually apply. Um, so simply, it started where we were co-finance partners with the studio. So I got very lucky that early on, when I say lucky, I got you know lucky on one part and unlucky on other parts. But uh, I was able to co-finance about a hundred movies with Sony, Universal, Paramount, Lionsgate, you know, pretty much every studio, Warner Brothers, um, and in, in executive producing uh, or in co-financing, I also insisted I executive produced, which doesn't mean I went on set and told people what to do. I actually got to sit back and see how they do it. I got to see how do they look at IRRs and ROIs and, you know, what's the model and how do they decide on, you know, what the right budget is and what's the right amount to pay actors and really what are the P&Ls behind it. And, um, and through <coughs> doing over 100 movies that way, working with virtually every studio, I realized the model was, was, was just broken. It literally ran the way it ran in 1916 and 1920 which in 1916 and 1920, which is when most, most this, actually the, the newest studio, um, depending on what you count lines get uh, before us, was, was Walt Disney, was Disney, which was like 1918. Everything else was before that. And um, mostly at the time, you had theatrical, and that was it. And that's the way that this business <coughs> still ran. Um, you know, and then when DVD came, it became such a big portion. They built up this huge infrastructure, and, you know, they, they kept it. So... We looked at what the kind of results that we were getting from slate financing, um, which were mixed. We had some that worked and some that didn't. But what we recognized is that the movie business um, really was uh, a venture capital model. So the studios are swinging for the fences every time. They have you know a big corporate parent that gives them a two billion dollar or three billion dollar you know allocation each year, and their model was was eighty five percent of their movies are going to lose money, fifteen percent are going to make money and, you know, or, or break even. And hopefully you have a home run or two in there if in that 5%. And overall, they get an IRR of 10 to 20%. You have a bad year, you lose a little bit. You have a good year, you do better. And the irony being that because there's this veil of secrecy over Hollywood, um, it, you know, when corporate parents come in and say, you got to do better next year, you know, they explain, well, we can't change anything because so-and-so actor won't work with us in the agencies. And, you know, they have an, a, a real way of, kind of moving the, the ball in the cup and, you know, with the corporate parent. So because we had been embraced into the co-finance world and accepted in the agency world, um, you know, when we sat back and we were probably the only ones that actually had the data of every studio, you know, it's shocking that if you go today, you know, and I ask any of you go to look online, it, whether it's Viacom or Warner Brothers or, or uh, News Corp, you cannot find the economics of a movie. You can't find what Avatar actually made or did not make for Fox. Um, you can see what the entire film that entertainment group did, which has no relevance because that includes a 100-year-old library. So um, we actually had those numbers. And so we, were, we really digested that and we were able to realize this, should be re this is a real estate model. This is not a venture capital model. What other business are you in where you, you kind of pick a piece of property, you invest tens if not hundreds of millions of dollars into that property in hopes that when you're done with it, then you spend a lot of money marketing it, that you're going to lease it for a lot of money in kind of that first lease window. You're gonna make the area hot and hope that the second tenant's gonna pay you more, and so on and so forth, and eventually when it gets run down, you're gonna rehab it, i.e. a sequel. So we looked at how we could flip the model on its head and actually take the economics and the risk profile and make them the same, which is actually turn it into a real estate model. So we went country by country for three years and we entered into, I don't think this has ever been done before, 117 partnerships in every country that are five to seven year partnerships where we picked so in every country, there's two types of distributors. There's the studios who all showed up and said, we're Warner Brothers, and they went and opened up in every single country and stuck big buildings up and 
you know, sent over thousands of people and distribute their own movies, and I, I call it the electric meter. They're just, they've always got to put movies through the pipe because they're burning. And then there's the local companies that have been there 100 years that can't compete with the big boys because really only American movies today go global. So they go, you know, take Germany, whether it's Senator in Germany or, you know, E1 in, in, in Europe and in, in, uh, uh, UK and Canada. You know, they're the ones that are distributing the local language movies and then once in a while buying a movie at can here and there. So we basically offered them a solution, which was you can have all of our movies. We'll give you all of them. You have to take all of them. You have no involvement, but it's for a pre-agreed percentage of the budget. And between that and a few other facets, we were able to take all the risk out of, out, or most of the risk out of movie making. So before we say go, our entire budget is covered. And then we built up um, from there our own domestic operation. And in building up our own domestic, we were very lucky because we don't have the legacy issues of a 100-year-old company. So we're, just as an example, if you look at a major studio, they probably have, I'm guessing, anywhere between 500 and 800 people in their distribution department. Those are the people that are calling and booking theaters and booking, the, basically they do three things. They book theaters, they collect money, and they try to hold the theaters. Well, that, that worked when you had 40,000 theaters that were mom and pop owned. You know, you needed a lot of bodies. Today, five major distributors own 90% of the market. One happens to own 60%. So instead of having three or four or 500 people, we have 22. And in those 22, we hired very high quality bodies of people who worked at the exhibition companies, had the relationships, and this is one of many examples, but we hold theaters as long, we collect at the same rate, uh, I'm sorry, we book as many theaters, we collect the same rate, and we hold theaters longer. Um, and in doing that, we were able to prove that, you know, the model of kind of 100 years ago is just completely inefficient. So when you look across our entire platform, whether it's television, movies, sports, uh, uh, fashion, and now our digital initiative, each one of those was looking at, you know, where the model had the inefficiencies. Um, it wasn't without its problems, Every, you know, as I would explain what we were doing clearly, and I'm probably already pissing people in this room off just by explaining what we're doing, but, um, you know, I'm, I basically was out there telling the big boys, you know, we're gonna do it better, and you guys aren't doing it right. And so there was a lot of uh, <laughs> disruption, if you want to say, I'm sure will. that was very well taken. Um, but. Uh, <laughs> You know, it was a lot of years of fighting against it, but uh, one of my favorite saying is if, if, is if, they're not if you're not carrying the ball, they ain't chasing you. So in our company, we always say the moment that they tell us, oh, you guys are doing a great job, and in the industry they start saying how good we are, is the moment we need to check ourselves because we're not innovating anymore. Mm -hmm. uh, let me ask you this question. So uh, how do you decide what projects you're gonna take on and, and, and not? I mean, because I think you know, so many of us think of Hollywood as, you know, oh, this was a great story, it's a great book, what about this actor? Sure. But that's not the way you are thinking about it necessarily. Well, we actually have a two-fold approach. So, first of all, one of the, the statistics that I just find staggering within Hollywood is that the average studio probably spends 110 to $120 million a year on development, meaning buying books, writing scripts, and they make about eight to 10% of what they buy. So that means they write off about $100 million a year in development that's never to be seen again. Um, we spend four million a year on development. We have about a 96% ratio of development to production. So um, two things come from that. One is when I first started, it was very formulaic. And I thought I had cr I'd figured out, you know, the science to, mo to movie making. Um, and that was, you know, we spent a lot of time and hired a lot of different people to work on kind of a, a regression system. And we took every single movie and put in, you know, every single characteristic from actors to release dates to genre to, you know, wh whatever you could think of. And we'd plug the characteristics in of a particular movie, run 10,000 iterations, and it would say, 80% of the time this movie makes money and here's your average IRR. And in 2006 or seven, I was quoted all over the press to say, movies are just like widgets. And I used to get calls from my friends who were filmmakers saying, you can't say that, you're pissing everybody <laughs> in Hollywood off. Um, but they were right, actually. Movies aren't widgets. They, they are creative, and there is a creative nature to it. And the thing about movies also is that it's a consumer product, and consumer behavior is very fickle. So you have to balance both, and that's what we've tried to do in the company. So basically, the f you know, there's two sides to it. One is we have a, finan a very rigorous financial kind of analysis done on, on each project. Um, and we get the project similarly to other people. You know, we have directors, we have pitches, we have books. The difference is, you know, when we sit down with that guy who will sell a book to a studio for $4 million, we, we, take, we pay zero because effectively he knows if it's coming to us, we're making the movie versus at a studio who's gonna spend three years battling it out. So in doing that, we first look at who's the audience, what's our target genre, what's our demo, what, and what's our risk. So we're looking at our output deals, 
um, we were able to strike when, again, when, when Netflix today, it's a big topic, but back when we made our deal with Netflix, you had the head of virtually every studio saying Netflix is a flash in the pan, it's going to blow up, and you know, we made, we kind of changed the window in our deal with them. And that allowed us to do some very unique things with the digital window. So we take our, our basically the, the uh, financial characteristics of that movie, run it through a model of the worst case. So um, having sat through green light committees at studios, they say, well, Mark Wahlberg and Brad Pitt are in it, can't do under 80 million. We look at it the other way as, you know, if we only get one, one piece of the target audience, what can this do, 25, 24 million? And wherever that break even is, is where we run kind of our, our green light to. Um, and if, from a financial perspective, our models don't show, and we use multiple different models, that we can't hit that kind of in the worst case, the worst case, then automatically it won't be made. But from a creative perspective, we have an entire team um, in-house. Uh, we do everything from the script, the casting, uh, you know, and the one thing that we've changed is that also studios, I think I'm talking for a long time, so I'll wrap it up quickly. <laughs> also studios um, uh, employ a, a model where they do these um, producing deals. So they pay a lot of third-party producers tens of millions of dollars to, for overhead and for development, and then those producers bring their projects in and battle with the studios to try and get them greenlit, and they get the budget down, and eventually they go, and they're, aw they're completely at odds. We do everything in-house. Um, all of our, our own line producers work for us, our producers work for us. So then from the creative perspective, the creative side has to actually say this makes sense because you know we're only ma we're making 15 movies a year, so we're not just green lighting it because the, the financials say yes, which would have been our old model. So that now we actually call it a more of a rejection model. If the financials say no, then we won't make it. But if the financials say yes, then it creatively has to make sense, and we still go through the same process of who's the right actor, who's the right director, who's all the pieces that a studio does. Now, Saad, in terms of um, what you're doing in Afghanistan and in the region in terms of building Moby, um, you have a different approach to the content creation uh, that you're working on, both the content that you, the original content that you create and then also content that you bring in. And you are, I would say, most people would think in a much more um, potentially volatile environment. I don't think many people look at Afghanistan. Uh, it, through your lens, most people would see a war-torn nation. They see United States troops pulling out at the end of the year. They see um, an election coming up. But do, but you see, you saw a, an emerging market and a business opportunity. Talk a little about well, that. Well, <coughs> we have a regional business now, but uh, the, the the initial connection was a, was an emotional one. We have to go back to Afghanistan because there was an opportunity after 9/11, which we did. We set up a small radio station and we built the business from there. But to date. Um, Afghanistan is probably one of our smaller businesses. Uh, we have a regional business that, you know, uh, various platforms, television in particular, that reach 100 million plus people <coughs> daily. So for us, in terms of challenges, um, you know, we have obviously uh, terrorism to deal with. We have corrupt governments to deal with. We have uh, regimes that don't like us. For example, we we have a a commercial uh, pirate TV station going into Iran. So we have uh, the Iranians trying to jam our satellite signal, intimidate uh, advertisers, and of course uh, they've locked up a few of our employees who've gone back to Iran to visit family. So we have those sorts of challenges, but ultimately you know, we, we did see the barriers as low enough for us to get into these markets. For example, Iran's got a billion dollar advertising market, or it did before the sanctions. Or in a place like Pakistan, it's, it's been growing at 15% per annum for the last five years. And you're talking about 200 million people. Or even in Afghanistan, off a very low base, it's been going at 50 or 60% per annum for the last uh, 10 years. So there are enormous opportunities for us uh, in these markets. And it, of course, as you know, Iraq, for example, it's, it's, an, it's a volatile, but still it's a market that's uh, it's got a $200 million ad market, which is going to grow to a billion dollar ad market. So for us, it's, it's almost like the concept of junk bonds. You have enough of them. You have enough diversity. <coughs> That even if you lose one or two markets along the way, you know you will you will prevail and you will have a, a good business ultimately. Talk a little about the content that you're creating that you're for these audiences and how you're thinking about the content for those audiences because I think it's a, I found it a little bit surprising when we were talking about it. Well, I think ultimately people are very similar. So what works sometimes in the West also works in in our neck of the woods. The Voice has been a huge success in the West. It's a success in China. It's a success in Afghanistan. 
or for example, we've done deal or no deal in Afghanistan and also in Iran. Um, you know, it's very challenging as to where we film these sorts of things and where we get the people from, but still, it's doable. And we do a lot of soap operas. We, uh, you know, for example, now we're looking at telenovelas from Colombia. We're adapting them for South Asia and Central Asia. And we also buy a lot of content. So we buy, for example, one of the shows that's worked really well is 24. Uh, ironically, in places like Iran and Afghanistan, and Homeland. Uh, I think we were one of the first companies that bought Homeland for outside the U.S. because I know the producer very well. So, and we do a lot of sports. We created a league in Afghanistan called the Afghan Premier League. Uh, we sort of redeveloped football uh, in a, a much more professional league, and it's been a huge success for the country. So you're creating role models. You're and the content is, you will not be surprised uh, by what you see on television in all these markets. But as I understand it, there are some who, I mean, you have to think about both what the audience is interested in, but then, as we were saying, you know, there are sort of political considerations, like the idea of showing um, a woman judge on Afghan Idol, right? So men and women together in a very different context. Yes, I mean, uh, the, the, you know, we, we are in a, in a very volatile region uh, with some you know, very unsavory characters who see us as a, uh, as, as a force that challenges their authority. Uh, we're not just talking about religi the religious establishment, but also the political establishment. You know, television is taking away, I mean, uh, it used to be the pulpit at the, at the mosque, but now television has become where, you know, the, the, the place to go to to get information. Um, and uh, to get different views. So television, uh, in particular, has, has this, this ability to transform societies. We inform, entertain. Uh, in a place like Afghanistan, where it's very corrupt, we hold institutions and individuals accountable. Um, so it plays a very important role. And I think that the way we challenge different authorities throughout the region uh, is, is the reason why they don't want us around. And so yes, we do have, uh, you know, we've uh, had um, assassination attempts, we've had people locked up, uh, beaten up, uh, and you know, I think that uh, they're, they're not going to go away in, in the short term. I hope we're all wearing bulletproof vests. <laughs> <laughs> but I think it's safer than Hollywood, I guess. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I think that's probably right. Shark attacks, that, that's exactly. for sure. <laughs> uh, so, uh, in, a, in a different context, but similarly, Joe, in the work that you're doing, I mean, you're talking about, when you're talking about vaccines, you're talking about in, uh, engaging investors, but you're also talking about having to engage partners, uh, local governments, similarly, who may be resistant to change, may have their own ideas about how things are done. And I think some of the work that you all have done at the Gates Foundation has really been able to change that and sort of get people in a lot of these countries to change the way they think about what's possible. Talk a little bit about that. Yeah, well, I hope that change is occurring. Um, one of the things that we are working on, the top priority of the Gates Foundation, is the eradication of polio by 2018. And it's an example of how you can take a disease and, and really model out what eradication would look like, how much it costs, what do actors need to do to come together, what are the technologies that, that you need to, to bring to bear. But one of the things Jeff was, was saying, I think, is, is that technologies alone won't deliver themselves. You, you really do need to create the conditions on the ground to be successful in delivery. And, and uh, not surprisingly, the last three places in the world where we have polio, three very difficult countries to work, Afghanistan, Pakistan, and, and uh, the northern part of, of Nigeria. But and you so, guys are going to fix Afghanistan, right? We're working together. We are yes, working together. Okay. We are absolutely <laughs> working together. Because we, we really do need, um, like I said, you can have all of the, the, the right characteristics, the right qualities, but in the end it does come down to people and politics and you do need to create the right kinds of incentives and in uh, both Afghanistan and, and Pakistan we have a situation where the Taliban has been targeting health workers that are trying to deliver polio vaccine um, and, and a lot of that goes back to US policy where um, CIA agents posing as vaccine workers tried to gather intelligence on the whereabouts of Osama bin Laden so there was uh, naturally, a, a fear, a climate of, of distrust about UN vaccine workers, and, and that has manifested itself on, on now going after uh, vaccine workers. And so we really do need to build up our local intelligence capabilities. We never thought we were going to be in that business, but it's the, it's the thing that will decide whether or not we're successful in the eradication of this disease. The other thing that I know is that's interesting in the work that you're doing and something that you wrote about it 
is sort of teaching the companies that are um, investing with you that they can sort of do good and do well. And in, in some cases, sort of by investing in the people in that particular area or country, it struck me, this is the communications person in me, it is also brand building in a sense. And I mean, and that seems to be part of the message in terms of caring about the people that who are going to be your customers or who are going to be the people that you'll, you know, these are the people you'll be relying on. Yeah, I think that's right. And and even stepping back, I mean, one of the things Ryan was saying about changing the system, we, we fundamentally felt that the role of the Gates Foundation early on was to rethink the system of, uh, of a number of things. There's U.S. education, but also in how research and development happens for the poorest in, in, in the world. Um, when we started, about 90% of the total R&D dollars going to health represented 10% of the global disease burden. And we sought to, to uh, get that back in line a bit more. Um, those numbers haven't changed dramatically, but there are a lot more incentives today to get drug companies and other innovators in, involved in, in uh, the development of, of new tools for, that serve uh, populations living um, in, in the poorest countries. Um, likewise, we're starting to see companies who are, are appreciating the value of uh, getting more involved in, in I call this the, the, the post-CSR, um, corporate social responsibility era, where companies really do understand that, that being engaged in the communities where they work is not just a uh, a good thing to do. It helps their, their, their bottom line, particularly those that are trying to see and, and go into emerging markets. Uh, and so that is a, a real opportunity, not just for companies to, to write checks to good causes, but really to lend their expertise, to think about the, whether it's supply chain or marketing to, to uh, uh, the bottom of the billion uh, population consumer. Um, how do we take that same kind of expertise and apply it to, to things like health and education and agriculture delivery? So it's an exciting time for us, we think. So I want to pivot from that to you, Nancy, because uh, I find it fascinating what, what you have done in your young life. Um, in terms, talk about the Palmer that you developed in, uh, for vaccinations. And tell, one of the things I would love for you to tell this audience is, is one of the things that strikes me about this group of people is that some of the innovations or some of the creativity sort of comes by chance by and you had mentioned that your initial intent was not actually vaccines you had a different you came at it from a completely different perspective yeah absolutely so uh, to give everybody a little bit background um, when I was in college I had just been developing lots of different things like freshman year uh, this device for glaucoma patients and then um, as, a, as a weekend project, I built this text-based 911 system at UC Berkeley, and it literally took maybe just two days, and the university paid me $15,000 for it. So I was just like, oh, great, this is a great, you know, this is during the budget crisis. So I was like, okay, so there is money around, and I should just keep <laughs> building things. Uh, and then, so when I started building the polymer, it was looking back at my own background. I grew up in rural China. Uh, where I grew up in the village, there's no running water. There still isn't any running water. I went back last summer and installed water pumps in my grandparents' homes, and there's very limited electricity. So the problem with vaccines, and for most of the vaccines, it's liquid vaccines. You have to keep them between two to eight degrees Celsius. So you have to keep them refrigerated. And that's a problem when you try to transport them to any rural or hard to reach areas in the world that either don't have infrastructure or you know, electricity. And so um, how I started, this was always in the back of my mind, and the opportunity or the chance that you're mentioning was literally uh, when I was right after taking a break from a hacking session, my friends and I, we like to just build computer programs for fun on the side. We were at a bar sure. and <laughs> literally. You know, after 911 <laughs> programs, just get a little hacking. So, my phone <laughs> so, so right after a hack session, uh, during, during um, a break it, while I was in college, um, I, we were at a bar just hanging out, and then there was this, there, literally the story was there was this cute guy, and I told my friend, oh, that guy's really cute. And, and then my friends were like, oh, actually, he's this incredible genius from MIT who um, did his undergrad in biochemistry, then got an MD and PhD before he was 26. And so at that point, I was just like, okay, you know, for, forget dating him, I want to work with him. <laughs> and so we started working together in the research lab, and 
and I'm really summarizing this, but through a lot of trial and error, something that we were playing around on the side, and because you, you really can't go in to trying to say, I'm going to develop a polymer that's going to be a heat stabilizer. I mean, it really has to be you have a broad understanding of all these different kinds of chemicals, and one that you're working with can be manipulated to be a heat stabilizer. And that's what happened. We were in the lab, and we were using this polymer that was for actually stem cell research and cartilage regeneration. And we realized that it could actually be manipulated to be a heat stabilizer for <coughs> vaccine, particularly for protein-based liquid vaccines. Uh, and so when that happened, we were like, oh, this is really cool. And so um, then we went and we, we published the technology and then it won um, the top research prize at the World Biomaterials Congress. And this is right when I was graduating last year and we, we got the prize and I was like, oh, sweet. And so I said, <laughs> <laughs> Love so it. Let's, let's keep developing this. And um, immediately we got a lot of funding. And the great thing is we never have had to go out to raise private money. There's a lot of opportunity for us to go and take every opportunity to apply for grants and for award money. And so I remember like I pull, pulled an all-nighter um, like my last semester and it was to Duke University. They had this grant competition and I just sent in the application and then like a couple weeks later we got $70,000. So uh, you know that worked out really well and we just kept doing that and that was the efficient way to um, not only convince a lot of PhD MIT scientists that hey they should be working for like you know, at the time it was 20, 21 and so you know it was very sure. hard to get them to <laughs> to believe that I could actually build this company. But then uh, because of winning all the grant and award money, they knew, oh, I will actually make a salary doing this. And so it was a little by chance, but also because I always knew I wanted to uh, develop this and figure out a solution, I was always looking for opportunity. If I met anybody that was very smart, um, everyone I work with is smarter than me. So if any time, I found somebody that was really smart and in a sector that, in the back of my mind, I have a list of all these things I want to build. If they could help me build one of those, then I'm going to immediately want to work with them and convince them uh, to, to work on the project. Very impressive. So in each of these instances, we're talking about successes. And one of the things about you innovator types is uh, disruptors. Sometimes we fail. And sometimes it takes a bit of failure to actually, and I think it sort of takes uh, the stomach to fail in order to ultimately succeed. And so I want to put that question to all of you. And I'll start with you, Ryan, and just okay. let's talk about that. Because I do think that sure. is part of the ethos of, you know, if you're going to be a disruptor, you've got to recognize that you may have to have uh, more of a, a willingness for that than others who, who play it safe. Yeah, I think that, that I, that's kind of our philosophy. I mean, listen, I've failed many more times than I've succeeded. I think it was Churchill who said, success is only what happens in between failures. Um, and anybody that's going to be, you know, entrepreneur or launch a business, try something new, not just even if it's, you know, disrupting or not, you know, I think you, you, you're going to face failures. It's the first question that I ask any senior executive in an interview, which is, you know, tell me what you've tried at and failed because I actually think you don't learn from successes. So I failed. I started a hedge fund when I was 19, a couple investors in here. Um, and uh, it, by 21, I was doing everything that a 21-year-old shouldn't have been with, or should have been with too much money. And by 23, I was living in a $1,400 a month apartment I couldn't figure out how to pay for and figuring out if I was going to go back to med school or not. Um, you know, and that was pr really my first big failure. Uh, you know, by the time uh, in this company, you know, for all of the successes, you know, we all publish our successes because that's what we're supposed to do, but we don't list our failures and we've certainly had our share. Um, you know, I think that, that the most important thing is you learn by failing. You know, our, part of our motto, you know, when you look at kind of our company as a whole, um, you know, we're, we call ourselves a fully integrated media company. So, you know, we're the largest producer of reality TV and the second largest sports agency and largest fashion agency, we put it all together, we try to put all the divisions together. <laughs> in doing that though, and in trying to create what we call kind of the perfect turnkey media solution, there were so many pieces along the way over the last six years. This wasn't just one day we went, okay, we're now a 360 turn company, that we, we failed. And we learned from the failure and said, what went wrong? And you know, how do we fix it? Because every time we succeed, we high five and we go out for drinks. And you don't, you know, it could be luck, it could not be luck, but you don't really learn that much from success. 
And so um, even in movies now, uh, every time we have a movie or a television show, whether it succeeds or doesn't, particularly when it doesn't, we have a, a state of affairs afterwards. And we really talk about you know, what, what didn't work, what, where did we screw up? And, and you know, it's really easy to point it out and be like, well, the audience just didn't come, or they, it rained in New York, or you know, people didn't tune into NBC that night, or Amare played a terrible game. But you know, <laughs> the truth is that you know, w w that's where you learn the most. And, and I think that any entrepreneur, whether you're gonna, you're gonna challenge a system, which you know, we're, we're about to, in a couple days from now at MIPCOM, you know, when I had the studios hating me, now I'm gonna have all the networks hating me, we're about to challenge that system. Um, but uh, when you're, you're gonna fail multiple times, and if you don't think you're going to, you shouldn't be an entrepreneur. Mm -hmm. So, you know, Jeff, I wanted to bring this over to you because one of the things that we were talking about last night after dinner was the idea that in different, in, in different environments, it's not okay to fail, and there's not that environment to fail, and I, I think many would agree with Brian that you do learn something from failure, but if you are in a culture or a climate where that is not acceptable, that creates a whole different set of challenges. Uh, absolutely, that comes back to the notion of mindset. I mean, Ryan talks about frequent failure. It's the converse, is continuous improvement. I actually don't think of breakthroughs in improvement are likely to occur very often in your career. They make great copy when you achieve that, but I think actually what's more likely to be the entrepreneurial way is just sheer hard work. It's not very glamorous, actually. Most entrepreneurs don't live glamorous lifestyles. They actually are very methodical, and they'll analyze the failures, and they should analyze the successes, and they should be small. But I think what tends to succeed is if you can maintain that vision that you really do want to be the best or the first at what you're doing and sustain that vision even as you're failing. But you need to be able to be able to measure what you need to deliver performance improvement and see that you're trending at least to the goal. And I think if people work in a culture where failure um, is punished, that first slip up is usually, that's it. Somebody's out of the role, they don't get the promotion or that first startup doesn't succeed, they don't do another one. I think Britain could learn from the States where I used to work in Silicon Valley where I always thought failure was a badge of honor. And actually, you wouldn't get the top job unless you had some history of struggling because you know what failure feels like. I think in this country, we tend to be a lot more cautious and tend to talk down about somebody who's had a spectacular failure and don't tend to encourage them to have a go again, which I think is something we can learn from across the pond. Sean, your thoughts? <coughs> well, I think, um, I think you have to fail, uh, and we do fail uh, daily. Uh, yeah. Programs don't work. Uh, outlets uh, fail to achieve what, uh, you know, what, what, what we, we've aimed for. But the important thing is to cut your losses, to, to, to not be particularly emotional. Um, and to cut a business, to shut it down, to cut a program, you have to sack people, sometimes sadly. We produce about 16 hours of content daily. Uh, so we're bound to get a lot of things wrong. But, you know, but having said that, I mean, we, we can also be very stubborn. I mean, I, I, I have stuck by a, a particular entity that we've had which started to lose money and bled for 26 months, consecutive months. And my partners, uh, News Corporation, uh, you know, they have you know, deeper pockets than I do. They were, they were very encouraging uh, you know, in terms of shutting the business down, and we didn't. So it turned a profit last month for the first time in 26 months. So sometimes you have to rely on your instincts as well. Uh, you know, I think that you, you try to be as, as, as clinical and as, uh, as cold as you can, but there are instances that you go with your instinct. I want to switch gears a little bit, and Nancy, I'm going to start with you, just to talk about data and the collection of data, because for all of you, data is so critically important uh, to what you're doing, how you're doing it. Um, we had an interesting conversation last night uh, with General Hayden, former head of the CIA, because as you may know, in the United States, we've had quite a conversation about data collection and privacy. And one of the things that strikes me is that in, in so much of this innovation, Joe, you've talked about making sure that you're able to collect data effectively to know uh, in a village, are people taking the vaccines? Is it working? Obviously, Saad, you need to know, are people, you know, what programs are working, what aren't, what movies are people watching, what aren't they? Um, advertising, what are people responding to? Um, but you're, so you need that information and that data, and at the same time, I'm curious, what the pushback may be on how much is too much and how do you sort of push that line? 
Uh, that's a really good question. I think it comes between, so, so the company, I started in another company called Implug, which is based in Los Angeles. And for Implug, we developed the most advanced network of digital billboards. And traditionally, the digital billboard companies, they're not really tech companies. Typically, they're just real estate and advertising. And there's very little technology behind it. And so we wanted to change that around. So each of our billboards sends over 200 metrics every second to our network. And so we know exactly how many people are around our billboard. Uh, we have the technology that can identify, is the person looking at our billboard male, female, it's kind of like that minority report <laughs> kind of style. And so what we did at the beginning is actually we didn't use that camera system because the consumers weren't ready. So it's this fine line between us trying to push the market and consumers into accepting what kind of data they'd like to provide us, but at the same time being able to respond to the fact that maybe they're not ready for this yet. So right now how we co collect all the data of knowing how many people are around our our network is not using cameras, which we can do, and it will be much more accurate, but it's actually taking a step back and just actually doing cell phone pinging and seeing the cell phones around us and giving a unique identifier to each cell phone. And so uh, I know for us, when, when we went into this, we had to sh make sure all the locations that had our billboard was, was happy and they didn't want to, you know, they didn't want to kick us out because we were violating maybe privacy or worrying the people that were coming through these locations that had our billboards. So even moving forward, it's continuing that balance and slowly pushing this new technology because all we want to do is make, uh, use this data that we're collecting to make advertising and to make our customers at our brands much more efficient in how they're spending advertising dollars. Uh, I negotiated an exclusive with her before we walked up so nobody else can use that. <laughs> nobody can use that. So. And Joe, just in the context of the Gates Foundation, I mean, similarly, I mean, you know, we've talked about this, the, the, data, the methodology that you're able to use because of technological advances in terms of making sure that the vaccines are more effectively being delivered, and obviously then you have the data to go back to your investors and say, look, this was a good investment. Talk to us a little bit about that. Well, I guess a couple different examples. One is, uh, I talked about polio. The availability of advanced surveillance gives us an opportunity advanced to- Advanced surveillance. Yeah, t okay. difficult, isn't it? But it, from a disease perspective, you know, long tradition, but at the same, it, it does highlight the pitfall. The fact is that we have an ability that we didn't have even a few years ago to when we say, let's let's go out and make sure that every village, every home is, is um, ha has been visited by a vaccine worker and the children there have been um, vaccinated so that we don't miss anyone. We can see where um, workers have said, yes, I, I've done that, but in fact, they've actually went to the bar and had a long lunch and didn't cover any of the area where they were supposed to. So it, it does give us uh, uh, that opportunity, but there are security concerns. There are privacy concerns that people highlight that they're very uncomfortable with using these kinds of things that, you know, want in, that people may associate with drone technology. So it's, it's challenging. Um, another area for us that, that we are very, very excited about is the ability to use uh, advanced sequencing um, when you're looking at new forms of crops and uh, in, in agriculture, how we can look at the development of, of new crops that can uh, resist some of the more prevalent diseases or, or will withstand the effects of, of the inevitable effects of, of, of climate change. Um, but people are very, very, uh, I think, sensitive to, to the idea that you would be messing with the, uh, the food chain and, and, and looking at, at different um, ways of, of uh, adopting, adapting some of these crops. So I think the thing that, that for us we're most excited about in terms of the information revolution is putting access to information into the hands of people in developing countries who can increasingly hold their governments to account for increasing their spend on things like health and on agriculture. Uh, the power of the, the mobile telephone and, and what it does and, and the, the information that it um, uh, provides to people is, is really a, it's what Bono has called the, uh, the vaccine for corruption because I think we will see a, an amazing uh, new wave of accountability of people in developing countries who are, who are um, far more strident about making sure their governments are, are uh, more responsive to their needs. Do you think that's true in Afghanistan? Yeah, I mean, <laughs> in 2009, uh, when the elections were essentially stolen, uh, we started airing clips uh, from uh, polling uh, centers where people filmed uh, people stuffing ballot boxes on their mobile phones. And they didn't go to the authorities because they don't trust the authorities. They came to the media. And that's what we did. So we do hold 
uh, individuals and institutions accountable. And, um, and it raises the bar for the, for the state, um, and they have to deal with that. So I think it's very true. Jack, did you want to weigh in on this? Yeah, personally, I think data um, sensors to feed the data will absolutely disrupt business in many ways. Uh, if you can measure so much of what you want to manage, and in a sense, we can instrument the world that we live in, but then actually the business model can shift to who makes the best use of the intelligence that's fed from the products that you use or the sensors that you work. And the early adopters have been elite sports people. They set up body area networks. We model their performance. This is what we did for the Olympics teams uh, for London last year. We modeled performance. We got actionable intelligence. And then we codified what it took to get the best out of an athlete. Uh, the goal for going forward to Rio is keep that codification of data and compete with other nations because we're building up a database of intelligence on how to deliver human performance faster than any other country. Now, you extrapolate that into the health world, you've got real potential. If you're capturing basic data, it could be in rural Africa, it could be remote parts of China. These sensors are cheap enough to be worn. The pervasive comms help you. But what's lacking is the analytics to extract meaningful insight from that pervasive data. <laughs> and really, once you get enough data, and with a bit of machine learning, you can get predictive intelligence. And then you can start changing the game of healthcare. You can start giving people um, warnings when things don't look right before the symptoms are manifest. Now, I talked earlier about having a vision. That's where we want to get to. And being an engineer, I think the world's deterministic, which it's not. But I certainly think holding true to that vision and embracing data and embracing the idea that surely with systematic measurements and systematic accumulation of data, we give ourselves an advantage. For organizations like yours, you give yourself a better return on the investment because it's not trial and error. It's not ad hoc experimentation. You're actually capturing all the data and building on that intelligence. So I, I actually think data will really change our world. And just one final point, even on the products we use, you talk about movies that go out and the film producers don't know really how the audience related to the movie. Well, how many products actually gather feedback live as you use them? Digital products are pretty good, but physical products like a bike or a boat or even a car are pretty feeble in this regard. So you sell a unit and yet we've got no idea how you actually use the car. So when you bring the car back to the garage, shouldn't I be able to tune it up to the way you actually drive? Shouldn't I be able to show you how to set up that racket according to the way you actually served? Well, this isn't a pipe dream. We're already working in this area with um, pioneers in the space. We call them meta products. It's products that have the sensors inbuilt to them. So they, they actually feed intelligence back to both the user so they get more out of the product, also back to the vendor so they understand how their users use the product. So in sports products, that sounds trivial. But for medical delivery systems that you were, that's going to be a breakthrough. I think we have time for a couple of questions. And I see, do you have a mic with a microphone? Anyone have questions? No. Um, Ryan, could you talk about how your sort of biggest disappointment with uh, certainty with your models and your statistics where you thought, oh, this actor with this genre, with this release date, nailed it, and in reality, it didn't turn out, and what, what that sort of dispersion was between the data and the reality. Sure, well, you know, I, ironically, because that goes actually right back to whatever he was talking about. We're, we as a company are, are, are data hounds. Like I would say, for a media company, you know, we probably digest and bring in more data than most data companies. Um, our, our, our model that started as a uh, Monte Carlo exceeded the number of cells in Excel and it, when I had to go into C++ and Visual Basic mm -hmm. and we need IT guy, I mean AI guys just to run it. Um, and yet it's still anything but perfect. And I'd say some of the biggest disappointments um, were both the ones that we passed on and the ones that we took. So, you know, when you model a movie, um, we had a movie earlier this year called Movie 43 that I guarantee you maybe only a couple of the men in the room saw it. She saw it. She thought it was funny. <laughs> um, you know, and when you model it, um, you know, you have 15 A-list actors with a little bit of a through line doing the dirtiest, craziest stuff you could ever see. And when you model that based on 
what's happening in today's world where the kids are all going and watching, you know, they love to see celebrities go do crazy, dirty stuff on YouTube and they, they, there's millions and millions and millions of hits. You look at that and say, you know, listen, we're not going to get four quadrants. We're going to get all the young kids. And, and the movie ended up only doing under $10 million. Fortunately, it cost us six, so we were okay. But, um, but it was a, a big disappointment in that we were trying something very new, and we hoped that this was going to bridge an entirely new type of movie, because eventually, um, you know, this actually goes to a much bigger question, which is eventually in our business, you know, we have the, the shortest shelf life of any product. We put it out on Friday, and it's either alive or dead by Monday. So we got to spend the two months prior taking all of that data and trying to keep rerunning it, rerunning it, figure out what we're doing right and what we're doing wrong. And we tried that with that movie, and it just didn't work. The other one, I'd say, uh, you know, that, that um, you know, kind of flip side uh, is that there's some very big movies, you know, that are, were home run successes that our models just said were too risky. Um, you know, when we made 300, uh, we didn't really have the models at that point. That was kind of a, you know, a gut. And I can tell you right now, had we stuck 300 into a model, it would have said not to make it. And there's other movies we haven't made that people did that uh, went on and became very, very big successes. So, um, you know, again, that's where we shifted from a company that would always say, hey, we're, we're a purely based widget, you know, movies are widgets, to you've got to have that creative empirical, you know, layer on top. So you run the numbers to make sure they work. And then it has to actually go to a creative level to make sure that, that you understand consumer behavior and you kind of have a creative element on it. Other questions? I see any other hands up? Thank you. She thinks it was hilarious. Uh, I'd it's like great. to congratulate all of you. I'm, I'm exceptionally impressed. And I just wanted to, uh, coming from a European uh, background, uh, I was educated in the United States, and I get a sense that all your abilities have really come through being in, in, in the U.S. to a certain extent. How do you see places like Europe, which you know things have been a lot more walls are raised, governments are more in control of what we do here. How do we break through these barriers? And maybe on the Gates Foundation, you guys, I guess, have to have a lending hand to different countries and, and organizations. Maybe you can start off by answering, what can we do to kind of make governments open up their doors? I'm Greek. In Greece, we have a lot of problems that we need to really get the entrepreneur back in action. Entrepreneur, Greek entrepreneurs do very well Australia and in, in, in America, uh, but back back home we have a lot of problems, and mainly based on government sort of controlling us. So how can people like yourselves? I guess Afghanistan is a very good example of places where you try to get this barrier broken down. So I don't know, maybe you could get, uh, ways we could kind of help break these barriers down. Yeah, sure. Well, I, I do think there are some good examples of where. Europe is, is increasingly, and I, I say that, uh, you know, it's hard to generalize Europe broadly, but for the purposes of the time and your question, I do think there are lots of examples. And one is in the philanthropic area, where philanthropy is, a, is still, I'd say, a relatively new concept, or the concept of the big foundation. Uh, you, you, you find, certainly, the uh, levels of wealth, but not a lot of active giving in the form of a, of a foundation where you're directing a very... Uh, active portfolio of, of investments and, and, and you know, putting it into high-risk areas uh, like R&D. But that's changing. I mean, we, we see the rise of an organization here called SIF, the Children's Investment Fund Foundation, uh, backed by a very um, generous and, and, and successful hedge fund manager, Chris Cooper Hone. Um, and, and that, I think, is a, an example of where we're starting to see more venture-like, philanthrocapitalist type tendencies in an organization. Um, and, and second, I would say there are uh, th there is, a, I think, an irony in, in some of the, the ways that we've been working with governments where the U.S. has simply st uh, stood on the sidelines. I mean, a lot of the innovative finance mechanisms that, that we've used or, or backed over the years, there's been several to try to guarantee a market for uh, products that don't yet exist. It, this is called the Advanced Market Commitment. Those were primarily signed by and, and backed by European governments, and where the U.S. said, we just don't have the flexibility within our current system to, uh, to, to participate in, in, in that kind of system. Where, where I do think there's, there's the potential is to increasingly invest in uh, education in universities and, and to think about that life cycle um, and, and how um, universities can support the incubation of, of new firms where you... you you don't have as, as much a, a developed system as, as, say, in the U.S., the Stanford's, the MIT's, Harvard's, where I think that, that cycle of, of uh, investing in, in, in um, you know, with, with seed money into new ideas, where that's much more prevalent. Bob, did you want to weigh in? 
Well, well, I think there's another problem also that we have in our region is that people have a sense of entitlement in some of these countries. Uh, the state has to help them. They're unwilling to work. And I think if uh, you know, people need to be educated, then we try to do that through our, through our media outlets. That they have to take ownership of issues, whether it relates to the economy or the environment. You know, they cannot just sit back and complain. They have to actually take ownership. And I think in a lot of these uh, sort of European countries, and particularly in Southern Europe, you see people having that sense of entitlement. And you have to, you know, it's going to take a generation to change them. But change they must. It seems a little bit like the opposite. I mean, from my perspective, and I'm just a movie guy, so you know, from my perspective, people in Europe buy movie tickets, so I'm not complaining. But, um, but uh, you know, it seems that you know I get concerned that America is actually moving more towards Europe in that sense, and and you know that the biggest issue is actually that that when I mean you kind of um, uh, so I kind of touched upon it, which is you know when you start giving people the ability to say, well, you know, the government's just going to give me. Or the government's just gonna, you know, run my life, give me my money, tell me how to be. You start getting complacent, and you know, a big part of the population um, actually kind of doesn't really have a vote anymore because they don't really care. And at the end of the day, if you give them that alternative of you don't really have to work hard, you can make enough money to just live, then you know. And I feel like, I mean, the, what the longest power regime was what two, three hundred years since you know back since the China days. You know, and that's because people get complacent. After 200 years, they start giving the government more and more and more power. They get complacent, and all of a sudden, you wake up, and you know, you have innovation is dying. The government's running everything, and people aren't really that open to change. I'd love to add one one of the things that being a young entrepreneur, and you think of some of the biggest companies and innovations, and just business model innovation that's come out of the U.S., like. Uber, like Dropbox, Airbnb, Instagram, they were all founded by people under 30. And one of the things I think the U.S. right now has done a good job is not relying, like I never relied on government funding for Implug. It was all private equity. It was all private investors, uh, people that had be, been entrepreneurs themselves investing in young people. Uh, and I, I always encourage people to, okay, you're investing in these big blue chip companies, you're investing in a hedge fund, but what about a young person who's going to build, uh, you know, like the next Facebook, Instagram? Um, so, for example, one of my investors is the co-founder of Oak Tree Capital. I mean, he had not considered startups before or investing in startups until I reached out and I said, hey, you know, you're investing in these companies that, you know, they're safe, they give you a certain amount of return, but what if I said, hey, I'm going to build you a company that's going to be multi-billion dollars in the next three years and give you a return that's 100x. Yes, you're taking that risk, but for the amount of money you're putting in, it's the same amount of money you're going to, actually even less than what you would put in into a hedge fund, it's going to give you a bigger return. And then you have the opportunity to fuel innovation. So everyone here, I imagine <laughs> all of you can actually be investors, and then if you want to help Europe innovate, it's, it's investing in young people and it's investing in because right now I, I started a lot of companies because I was young and there's no risk I don't have a family that I need to support I'm willing to take those risks and to make the decisions I think are going to be best for the company not necessarily the the ones that are going to be the safest and by investing in young people that's where I think you're going to see a lot of growth and innovation yeah. so be in the back of the room Wait. With a credit card reader. <laughs> <laughs> Unfortunately, we have to leave it there because uh, it's lunchtime, I believe. I want to thank our panels for excellent conversation. Thank you. <laughs>